Welcome back to Reliving the War, the show where we compare weekly episodes of Raw and Nitro to see which show was really the best. We have reached the 30th of October, the night following Halloween Havoc 1995, so to kick things off, let's look at the Halloween Havoc results before beginning our weekly comparisons. In the opening match at Halloween Havoc, Johnny B. Bad was able to defeat Diamond Dallas Page to become the new WCW World Television Champion. Randy Savage defeated the Zodiac in around 90 seconds. The Zodiac replaced Kamala, who had just left WCW before Halloween Havoc. Kurosawa defeated Road Warrior Hawk. Sabu got a win over Mr. JL. Lex Luger defeated Meng by disqualification, which meant Luger would now face Randy Savage later in the evening. The tag team match pitting Arn Anderson and Brian Pillman against Sting and Ric Flair was the match of the evening for me. Ric Flair double crossed the Stinger during the bout, meaning Pillman and Anderson got disqualified. Good guy Ric Flair was no more, it was all an elaborate scheme cooked up by three of the four horsemen. Hulk Hogan defeated the Giant in the Monster Truck match before Randy Savage got a victory over Lex Luger. And in the Giant vs Hogan main event, Hulk Hogan was disqualified because his manager Jimmy Hart pushed the referee before turning his back on Hulkamania. Lex Luger turned heel after the match also when he attacked Randy Savage and then the Yeti made an appearance, giving us one of the most awkward moments in wrestling history. The Giant left with the WCW Championship even though he won via disqualification and yeah, that was Halloween Havoc. I made a video about the Yeti recently on the channel to kind to go with this Reliving the War series, check that out if you want to learn more about Halloween Havoc. But for now, I'm super happy that I don't have to watch this pay-per-view again anytime soon. Both WCW and the WWF's pay-per-view offerings for October of 1995 were poor. I wish I could be more complimentary, but there's good reason why people call 1995 a bad year for professional wrestling. Okay, now that we're all caught up, let's begin comparing the October 30th editions of Raw and Nitro. Nitro is live from Dayton, Ohio, while Raw is taped, again from Brandon, Manitoba, Canada. We have some matches to kick things off. Over on the WWF side, we have the Raw debut of Goldust, as the bizarre one takes on Savio Vega. And on Nitro, we have Sergeant Craig Pittman taking on Eddie Guerrero. Let's start with Nitro then. Eric Bischoff and company are still reeling from Halloween Havoc. Eric says that some sort of videotape is on the way to the arena that will show us footage from the pay-per-view. Kinda indicating that we will see some new footage from Halloween Havoc, but let's wait and see. Eric says that Eddie Guerrero is replacing Randy Savage in this opening match due to the beatdown Savage took at Halloween Havoc from Lex Luger. And yeah, let's get on with the match. I think Eddie will have his work cut out for him here with Pittman. The match gets underway and you can instantly tell that Eddie Guerrero is limiting himself here. He knows Pittman is inexperienced and so Eddie works a much more basic match. Absolutely nothing like the showdowns we have seen on Nitro featuring Eddie against the likes of Dean Malenko and Chris Benoit. Eric Bischoff says Eddie Guerrero defeating Craig Pittman here on Nitro would be an upset. How he said that with a straight face is anyone's guess. This match then is filled with basic strikes and basic throws. Eddie Guerrero sells for most of the bout and the audience comes alive when Eddie hits a nice springboard crossbody and at around the 5.5 minute mark Eddie scores the win with a roll up. Bischoff is still calling this an upset by the way. The match was very average and we know Eddie can do better with the right opponents. Craig Pittman was very inexperienced here but Eddie should still be given credit for working around Pittman's shortcomings. 
So let's check the WWF out and see what happened during Goldust's Raw debut. This episode of Raw has a Halloween theme. The show kicks off with Todd Pettengill letting us know what matches we will see while putting on his best Dracula voice. In the arena, Jerry Lawler and Vince McMahon are wearing Halloween outfits and Jerry Lawler says that Vince McMahon got his costume a year ago but he never got a chance to wear it. Good stuff. Savio Vega makes his way to the ring and I'm actually quite interested in seeing what happens here. I mentioned last week that I felt Goldust's debut in your house 4 was quite underwhelming so let's see what happened here during his raw debut one thing's for sure though the wwf were making a big deal out of gold dust his entrance is quite long and vince mcmahon is trying his best to get the character over on commentary the match gets underway then and it seems the wwf and dustin runnels have the gimmick down to a t but the in-ring characteristics and nuances of gold dust still aren't there yet i know this was only gold dust's second televised appearance but something that really stands out here is his reliance on holds and while this normally wouldn't be a problem it stands out so much because we all know that Goldust was capable of so much more his moveset would evolve tremendously over the coming months but these early matches here really do show that he was still trying to work things out whenever the bell rang Goldust is most definitely a work in progress here, but it also makes for an interesting match too. Seeing how characters evolved over the years is always fun to do. Anyway, Goldust dominates most of the match. The audience pops when Savio Vega mounts his comebacks, but Goldust shuts down the Caribbean legend every time. Goldust gets the win with an inside cradle and I'm giving the point to Raw here. While Dustin wasn't where he needed to be just yet, he and Savio Vega still had a much more rounded wrestling match when comparing to Guerrero vs Pittman. Pittman's lack of experience was what cost Nitro the point here. Okay, so now we have a match on Nitro while the WWF are going to promote Survivor Series and show us some Milton Bradley karate fighters. Can the Shark and Scott Norton entertain us more than Hakushi and Barry Horowitz playing with some toys? Well, let's find out. First of all, look at how bad the perspective is here in this photo. I'm no Photoshop expert by any means, but come on, look at this. Anyway, the Shark vs Scott Norton was the blow-off match that nobody cared about. Remember, these two had a little scuffle backstage last week due to the Shark inadvertently costing Norton the September 11th match with Randy Savage. I mean, nobody cared about this really, but still, let's give it a chance. As the Shark makes his way to the ring, we learn from Steve McMichael and Eric Bischoff that Bobby Heenan has left the commentary desk and no one knows where he is. The bout gets underway and we have the usual big guy versus big guy prolonged collar and elbow tie up. Shark gets an early advantage but Norton is able to turn things around with a huge body slam that looked pretty impressive. We see Bobby Heenan eating food with Sonny Ono. We didn't know it was Sonny Ono back then as this was his debut but anyway Heenan seems to be making some sort of deal behind WCW's back. In the ring the action spills to the outside and at the two and a half minute mark both both men get counted out. Norton and the Shark continue fighting on the rampway and the segment and match is over. A poor showing from WCW here and I now honestly think that the Milton Bradley karate fighter segment over on Raw might have a chance. Before we get to that we see Doc Hendricks looking like the President of the United States and once again Doc is seriously excited to give us some news about the Survivor Series main event. Doc says that President Gorilla Monsoon has decided that the Bret Hart vs Diesel WWF Championship match at the next pay per view will have no countouts, no disqualifications and no time limits, meaning there has to be a winner. We briefly cut over to Razor Ramon and the 123 Kid. It seems that Owen Hart attacked Razor from behind but the cameras missed it. Hard to believe as this is a taped show but whatever. We then have the Karate Fighters advertisement, Barry Horowitz and Hakushi are arguing over nothing and so the two decide to settle their differences with a Milton Bradley karate fighter showdown. Horowitz gets the win and yeah I'm not sure what I've just watched. It pains me to do this but Nitro gets the point. Both shows were dreadful here but at least Nitro put on a live match and at least Scott Norton body slammed the shark. It's an undeserved point but a point nonetheless. 
Nitro is going to give us an interview with Brian Pullman, Arn Anderson and Ric Flair, while WWF Raw presents Marty Jannetty vs Joe Dorgan, better known as Johnny Swinger. I'd love to talk in depth about this match here, but I really have nothing to say. It's another two and a half minute bout that sees Marty Jannetty win with a flying fist drop. I will say though that Marty was oddly getting a lot of TV exposure during this time period, and it does feel like the WWF were getting ready to push him further up the cards. You may have noticed that he's been a regular on reliving the war here since he made his return, and all signs point to Gennady getting prepped up for bigger and better things here. Of course that didn't happen. But the match here was very average, nothing bad but nothing good either. Joe Dorgan was able to get in some small offensive flurries, but in the end, Marty is your winner. Over on Nitro we have that interview with Flair, Pullman and Anderson and maybe we can get some answers regarding Ric Flair's double cross at Halloween Havoc. Tony Schiavone is conducting the interview here so Mean Gene must have had the night off. I was interested in hearing what Flair had to say here. Remember Rick had been having some hard fought matches with Pillman and Anderson over these past few weeks so an explanation was definitely necessary. And guess what? No explanation was given. The three men gloat about fooling Sting at Halloween Havoc. Arn Anderson says the only thing of note when he says there will be a fourth horseman added to the stable very soon. Ric Flair tells us we better learn to love it as the horsemen are the best thing happening in wrestling today and the segment is over. I've noticed that Ric Flair has been kind of a MVP for Nitro during this Reliving the War series. I don't think Flair has ever lost a point for his side so far but I had a real hard time picking a winner here. There was no explanation at all about Halloween Havoc and yes I know Flair's the dirtiest player in the game and he's a horseman through and through. You'd have to be blind and not see that this was a big scam all along devised by the nature boy. But still you need to tell us how and why. Weeks and weeks of good guy Ric Flair were just pissed away here simply because diamonds are forever and so are the four horsemen. I expected a bit more from Ric Flair and the horsemen here but Gennady and Dorgan was also so painfully average. After some thought I decided to give the point to Nitro simply because there's nothing I can add to the Gennady match. It's a wrestling match where really nothing of note happens. The horseman nearly messed this one up and admittedly Flair's charisma was the only thing that carried this promo. Things have to get better. Up next, Jim Cornette and Davey Boy Smith are going to address the Survivor Series, while Nitro brings us Sabu vs Disco Inferno. Let's stick with Nitro. This would be Sabu's final match in WCW before going back to ECW. Let's see if he done the job on his way out. Disco dances his way to the ring, but Sabu puts an end to that nonsense with a punch to Disco's mouth. Sabu then begins his normal springboard offense, but just as things heat up, Disco is able to get the upper hand. I said this in my Disco Inferno video uploaded around a month ago but I find Disco fun to watch and during this match here Disco gets some good heat while dancing between moves coming across as really smug and goofy while fixing his hair and whatnot. Compare Disco here to the likes of The Shark, Marty Jannetty, even Sabu himself. What makes Disco stand out here is his sheer devotion to the character and while he may still be very green here He's definitely all in with the gimmick and that helps make what would normally be an average match a little more entertaining. That being said, these two didn't gel too well. Disco may have been putting the work into his character here but in the end Sabu scores the pinfall win in his final WCW match. After the 1-2-3 Sabu sets Disco up on a table outside of the ring. Sabu tries a plancha but Disco gets out of the way. The table doesn't break, Disco runs up the entranceway, Sabu doesn't sell the table bump and yeah match over. This wasn't too bad actually, nothing to write home about but a possible television match. 
While this was going on, Jim Cornette was in the ring with Davy Boy Smith over on Raw. Now, something that really sticks out here, beside Vince McMahon's ridiculous outfit, is the logic behind this promo in comparison to the Four Horsemen stuff earlier on. Cornette lays everything out in a way that anyone can understand, and this promo really does show how Cornette was able to deliver a heel promo while also talking a whole lot of sense. The Horsemen earlier talked about how great they were, but Jim was talking about injustice and what's more, Jim actually had great points to make. Cornette said that Gorilla Monsoon stated that the winner of the Bulldog vs Diesel match at In Your House 4 would meet Bret Hart at the Survivor Series, and Jim rightfully says that Davy Boy Smith won that match via disqualification. Cornette goes on to say that Monsoon is changing the rules to suit his agenda, and once again, Davy Boy Smith is being overlooked by the WWE. WF. It's simple, it's straight to the point, yet it's also something that many fans could have overlooked had this promo not aired on Raw. Cornette says that Davey wants a piece of Diesel and Davey also wants a piece of Bret Hart for costing him the title at In Your House. Clarence Mason is also in the ring. Cornette explains that Clarence is there to offer legal advice when it comes to Gorilla Monsoon and the decisions of the World Wrestling Federation. And Jim delivers this classic line when talking about Clarence Mason. Work. That's right. This man has been writing writs all day, and I've read the writs he's written. And if you've read the writs he's written, you'll know they're really well written writs. Clarence reiterates what Jim said in regards to the Survivor Series main event, saying that Davy Boy Smith should be the number one contender, and also Davy Boy Smith wants a match with Bret Hart. Marty Jannetty, who faces the British Bulldog next week on Raw, ended the promo here by clearing out the ring. Point for Raw, Cornette was fantastic on the mic. We got a great deal of storyline progression here that would take us all the way to December's In Your House show, and we also have a little heat going into next week's Jannetty vs Bulldog match. Sabu vs Disco was alright, but this promo here on Raw was better. Tag team matches next, we have Evil Lex Luger tagging up with Meng to take on the American Males over on Nitro, while Raw gives us the Smoking Guns vs Otis Apollo and Scott Demore. This is Nitro's last match. WCW ended their show with a long promo, so that very promo will go up against Razor Ramon vs Owen Hart to end this episode of Reliving the War. As Nitro's tag team match gets underway, Eric Bischoff says that next week's Nitro will be totally interesting. Active. Fans can phone in to decide who wrestles who before next week's broadcast on TNT. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Meng and Scotty Riggs start things off, but we quickly go to a commercial break. When we come back, Luger has been tagged in, and it looks like the American males are doing a good job with their consistent quick tags and double team offense. Lex turns things around, and the heel team are able to do some work behind the referee's back. Meng gets tagged back in, and Scotty Riggs takes a complete beating. You know what's coming next, folks. Riggs makes the hot tag after Meng misses a somersault splash. Jimmy Hart ends up distracting the referee as the American males look certain to take the win. Meng breaks up the cover and takes out Scotty Riggs with a super kick. Marcus Bagwell is all alone, Luger puts on the torture rack and it's over. Keep in mind that the American males recently were tag team champions and this completely new team of Luger and Meng were able to take them out with relative ease. Still, this one was okay, everybody got a fair amount of ring time and nobody overstayed their welcome, a decent match here that maybe lacked the star power that we've come to expect on Monday Nitro. And that reminds me, have you noticed that this episode of Nitro features none of WCW's biggest baby faces? There's no Randy Savage, no Stinger and no Hulk Hogan. They must have gotten the night off after that stellar Halloween Havoc pay-per-view. Over on Raw, the Smoking Guns vs Apollo and Demore is everything you'd expect it to be and less. A squash match for Billy and Bart here that completely lacks heat. During the match, the kid shows up via split screen, and if you remember back to In Your House, the kid had a tantrum after losing to the Smoking Guns. Kid apologises for his actions before challenging the Smoking Guns to a rematch. In the ring, Billy and Bart get the win with the Sidewinder at around the 3 minute mark. Their opponents got next to no offence in, and what we're left with here is a complete throwaway match. I will say that Billy and Bart were in great physical shape during this time period, and everything they'd done in the ring looked good, but this match is about as uncompetitive as it gets. A point for Nitro. 
Okay, main event time, Raw gives us the Owen Hart vs Razor Ramon Intercontinental title match while Nitro will present a Dungeon of Doom promo. Before the Nitro promo, Steve Mongo McMichael is having some Halloween fun at the expense of Bobby the Brain Heenan and Eric Bischoff shows us that Halloween Havoc footage that he mentioned at the top of the show. It isn't new footage at all, it's basically a replay from the final moments of the Hogan vs Giant match. They showed Jimmy Hart double cross Hogan and they even had the nerve to show the Yeti once again on WCW programming. Back on Nitro, the giant Kevin Sullivan, Lex Luger and Jimmy Hart are interviewed by Tony Schiavone. When Tony notices the WCW strap around the giant's waist, Schiavone says that the giant is not the WCW World Heavyweight Champion and the giant says nobody will take the title from him and if the giant says he's the champion, then he's the champion. Jimmy Hart says that Kevin Sullivan warned Hogan that evil was living in his home all along and that evil was Jimmy Hart himself. Jimmy then messes up when he says that he himself has been the only person to ever manage Hulk Hogan throughout his entire career and the promo ends with Kevin Sullivan letting us know that the giant would defend the WCW title next week even though technically he hadn't been named the WCW champion yet. Nitro goes off the air with Jimmy Hart running around in circles like an absolute lunatic. Unfortunately, this Nitro hasn't been great. Over to Raw, and I have serious high hopes for this Razor Ramon vs Owen Hart match. I don't think the bad guy in the King of Hearts will have much trouble beating Nitro's last segment, but let's see what happens. During Owen's entrance, that shill Barry Dudinsky is trying to con us into buying some little title belts, and he says he'll throw in some free 8x10 photos of Razor Ramon and Diesel. He's like the merchant in Resident Evil 4, I wonder what good shit he's hiding inside that jacket. Before Razor Ramon comes to the ring, we see Paul Bearer freaking out, talking about the return of The Undertaker and The Undertaker's deformed face. Back to the arena and the bad guy makes his way to the ring and it's time for the Raw main event. Razor attacks Owen before the bell rings, Owen looks pissed off as he climbs back in and the match starts off with Razor taking control, working over Owen's arm. Razor is in the driving seat during the first portion of the match and after the bad guy delivers a fall away slam, Jim Cornette jumps on the apron hoping to cause a distraction. Ramon punches Cornette and at this very moment, Yokozuna and Mr. Fuji make their way to ringside. Cornette hams it up a little and we go to commercial break. When we come back, Razor is still leading the way but Owen manages to swing things around by throwing Ramon to the outside before delivering a baseball slide. Owen then takes the lead for a while, Razor tries to fight back at one point but Owen delivers a great spinning heel kick to slow things back down. Things get a little annoying when another commercial break puts a stop to the action and when we come back, Razor is getting the upper hand once again. Not even two minutes go by and we have another commercial break and I know I said I wouldn't mention this really because it would be a common occurrence on both Raw and Nitro but it's extremely difficult to get into a match with three commercial breaks, it totally butchers the flow of the match. It's a shame too, from what we see, Razor and Owen worked hard during this bout, yet we don't get to see the whole thing in its entirety. The moment we come back from the third commercial break, Razor has Owen up for the Razor's Edge. Yokozuna runs in and pulls Owen down before delivering a clothesline to the bad guy and it's a DQ finish. The 123 kid hits the ring to try and save Razor from a post-match beatdown but Yokozuna makes quick work of the kid. Ahmed Johnson then makes an appearance, body slamming Yokozuna as the audience goes nuts. This was the first time Ahmed stepped into a WWF ring on TV and this body slam here done a lot to get Ahmed over with fans. Anyway, both shows are now over and I'm giving the final point to Raw. Even with the commercial breaks, Owen vs Razor was more fun to watch than the Dungeon of Doom promo. Had there been less commercial breaks, we could have had one of the best matches on Reliving the War so far, but still, even with Raw's main event shortcomings, I still enjoyed it more than WCW Nitro's final segment. Let's tally up the scores, again this is all just my opinion so let me know in the comments what you thought of these episodes of Raw and Nitro. 
Sergeant Craig Pittman's inexperience cost Nitro the first point. I thought the Goldust WWF Raw debut was better, but admittedly, Goldust still needed a lot of work. Both Raw and Nitro put on some really questionable stuff next, but I thought the Shark vs Scott Norton match was better than the Survivor Series Slam Jam and the Karate Fighter stuff. Three of the four horsemen did nothing to explain their actions at Halloween Havoc, but Ric Flair being Ric Flair helped Nitro score the next point, while Jim Cornette's excellent mic work helped Raw score the following point. The smoking gun squash match was nowhere near as competitive as the WCW tag team match that aired at the same time, and finally, WWF Raw scored the final point with their Owen Hart vs Razor Ramon main event. It's a tie this week with both Raw and Nitro scoring 3 points each. That means our overall scores on Reliving the War are 1 point for Raw, 5 points for Nitro and we now have 2 draws. In the television ratings, Nitro got the win with a 2.3 while Raw only managed a 2.1. Thanks for watching Reliving the War and remember to check out the Reliving the War podcast on all major podcasting platforms. Hopefully you join me next week when Bret Hart and Hakushi take on Jerry Lawler and Isaac Yankum in the Raw main event and WCW tries to capture a big rating with a Sting vs Ric Flair showdown. Again, thank you for watching.